Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Thursday morning trading session. What a uh, wild ride yesterday. The market fell off very sharply. This is the NASDAQ, of course, uh, we're talking about. Here was yesterday's trading. Huge decline right into the close and then throughout the Asian session and the overnight it looks like the market continued a little bit lower only to recover somewhat and pretty much start the day where we left off yesterday so for a change there's no opening gaps to deal with although there's no denying that the market is quite bearish looking. We'll, we'll stay with the market here for a few minutes. See if we can't watch them get their bearings and see which way the market might be leaning this morning, whether it's going to be continue to be bearish or maybe a little bit on the bullish side. We are getting signals, by the way, and that's not uncommon in a sideways market. That's uh, the problem, actually, in a sideways market is you get signals without any real follow through. So here we're getting a first micro macro cross lower. You can see pre-market we had a first micro macro cross higher. Uh, the first micro macro cross higher did not reach its profit objective. Not yet anyway. The first micro macro cross lower never tripped. So everything is still in a sideways fashion. Just looking here at yesterday's trading, it looks like we had one, two, three legs lower. That's usually all we get on the Eagle, so I don't know. Maybe we will see a little bit of a rally. I doubt it will be a significant rally after yesterday's sell-off. We are pushing up a little. Still very early. We're only three or four minutes into the session. This, of course, now on the Raptor. Had our trend change signal and a couple of continuation signals. David, you may want to email Ben as well at support at indicatorwarehouse.com. David's getting some license warnings popping up. Um, ben maybe hasn't activated everything. 
but yes, definitely contact Adam. All right, so things looking mildly bullish at the moment. Crude oil making a little bit of a push up off of a nice counter trend signal there. That's the soft edge buy. Craig, I'm glad you're in the room this morning. Uh, Craig asks, am I supposed to get a one, two, or three printing every time I get the verbal prompt? He says, I'll, I'll get a verbal prompt, but I won't always get the, the signal to print. Now, that's also a question that I'm afraid I'm going to have to refer you to Ben for, but I'm going to give you my input here in a second and just sending everybody Ben's email address. I believe the uh, verbal cue comes when the warning dot prints. The warning dot is just that. It is just a warning that the signal may be forming. It's not a guarantee that the signal will form. A lot of times we will see, well, I guess, uh, I guess this one here, where the warning dot prints, but we haven't gotten the signal until over here. I can't tell you for certain because I've turned my audio alerts off. And if you want to know how to do that, you go here to your indicator window and you find your tool and your audio alerts. Oh, those are my sounds. Where's my audio alerts? I have turned them off though. Where where do they go? Oh, it does say sounds enabled, but mine are not uh probably because I have all my other ones turned off too. But at any rate um, my audio alerts are turned off. But please check with Ben. But if I have to guess, I would say that is the reason that occurs. Okay, we've had a little bit of a run up here for the first 10 minutes of trading. As the buyers flex their muscles. Hmm. 
Um, okay, that's very odd, Craig. Craig says, I have gotten a hold of Ben, but he hasn't gotten back to me. Please resend him the email and send me a copy of it. And I will be sure to follow up with Ben for you. He might be out of town, but at any rate, I will, I will get an answer for you. I'm getting some comments here from other uh, room members that are confirming that the audio alerts um, don't always follow through. So, like I said, I do believe that is because they are queued to print with the warning dot. So if the market fell off now and got close toward the hard edge and we printed a warning dot, it would probably tell you that a number three signal was forming. Again, I'll have to double check with Ben to know for certain, but that's kind of my best guess right now. Yeah, Aspen says he's using the text pop-up message. Sometimes he will get it telling him about a hard edge buy or something like that. Uh, the text pop-up, I find works better in very slow markets. I suppose we could have used it the last couple of weeks when the markets were just crazy slow in case <laughs> you nodded off in front of your computer the text pop-up would let you know that a signal had formed I'm concentrating on the charts all the time anyhow so I don't mind uh, turning the audio alerts off, and I don't know if you guys can hear my system audio, because I remember when I was hosting the room early on, attendees were complaining about all the system prompts and everything. And, uh, and as a result, I that's how I ended up turning off the audio cues. Uh, Aspen's asking, do we have a, a number two signal forming in the Raptor right now? Well, I would say not. Why? Well, the number two signal is a counter trend signal, correct? So even though it's with trend, if you consider the great big picture, but currently we've got an uptrend. So we've got part one for a counter trend signal. We have an uptrend, but we don't have the test of the extreme yet, do we? We need to have both of those components before we can consider a counter trend signal. That's why this number two signal this morning right here 
I, right out of the open, I would not have considered a valid number two signal. Where's my, where's my trend? Well, I suppose you could say this is the trend, but you're kind of stretching it a little bit. Because technically, according to the Raptor anyway, your trend began right around here with your cloud crossover. So that's a pretty small trend to try to reverse from. You did get a test of the extreme, however, and a failure. So on the weaker setup, you may choose to wait for a second push opportunity. Otherwise, nope, it's not a counter trend signal. In fact, you can see the buyers given her Great guns here this morning, just all out. Okay, Aspen is asking, well then why all those dots and triangles? Every time a triangle prints, it tells you that all the signal parameters have been met. That does not necessarily mean that it's going to be a signal that is worth taking. That's why we try to focus on the higher probability signals. Now as, here let me start with the hawk. So we know with the hawk we we avoid yellow bars, for instance. We look for things like first micro-macro crosses, macro pullbacks for arrow consolidations, because those are our high probability trades. If we took every triangle hash mark, you know, from 5.30 to the market open, very few of those trades well, most of these were buys, so the buys would have worked out, but the shorts definitely would not have worked out. So why don't we take all the signals? Well, because not all the signals are worth taking. Yes, the signal parameter may have been met here, but it's printing off of yellow bars, so I don't want to take that trade. Why? Because yellow bar signals tend to fail. Same difference here for all our tools, including the Raptor. Yes, we had a signal print here. It was with trend. It's not one of our high probability signals, but as your trading approves, you can say, okay, well, the market's with trend. I, I can take that signal and I'm gonna cover the trade down there. Okay, I can afford that. I feel all right about that. The market goes up, hits your profit target. Here, you're printing counter trend signals, but as I've already explained, the only valid counter trend signal to take is first, you need a trend, then you need a test of the extreme. At this point, the Raptor sell signals all the algorithms that require a cell signal to print have been met. But it's not a high probability cell, is it? Why? Because we have not had our test of the extreme. Does that mean you cannot sell this signal? No, of course not. But it is a low probability trade. Would you like to do a low probability trade? Then by all means. And I'm not, you know, saying that facetiously. There will be times where, you know, maybe the signal is printing way up here. Maybe the signal is printing up here and you can take a low probability sell for, you know, a hundred bucks. And you may say, okay, I'll give that a go even though it does not meet any of our high probability uh, conditions. You may look at this and you may say, gee, I bet you the market's going to try to retrace and get back down here to where 
it stumbled a little be before. I bet you I can carve a hundred bucks out of that trade. And the market comes down and great. But at this point, when the market's printing right here, is it a sell signal? Yes, most definitely. Is it a high probability sell signal? No, absolutely not. Can I take that signal? Most definitely you can. Just be aware that it is a low probability trade. So, you know, normally I would tell you to risk it up there, but because it's a low probability trade, maybe you want to risk it there. Maybe you only want to put $50 on the line to see if you can make the trade work out. Maybe you're thinking, oh, I bet you it's going to slip to the hard edge before it bounces and gives me my test of the extreme. Or maybe you want to just try to scalp out with, uh, with $50 instead of going for the full target. Maybe you see this as a little scalp opportunity and you say, okay, I'll try that. And so the market comes in, hits your scalp target, and then reverses. But is it a signal that, you know, I would, I would recommend you take? No, no, not, certainly not to start. Maybe as your skills increase and you become more familiar with the markets and how, you know, the market is unfolding, then uh, then you may hop on board but right now your best course of action is to stay with your high probability signal so right here we have a high probability sell and we have a chance for a second push opportunity which is great because the market does seem to be a little bit stronger this morning So we've got the warning dots again. We've already got a completed uh, signal to short. If they come out here now with a buy signal, of course, we're going to have a um, hard edge bounce signal. We're almost at the top of the hour. So if we see a breakdown through here, we might just see the market fall off again and maybe even resume yesterday's downtrend. It's hard to say at this point. Okay, so now we have a follow-up number two signal. It did not print, but the parameters are still the same. You may view this, okay, uptrend, you may view this, oh, there it is, as a rather large or extended test of the extreme, and the market keeps bouncing off of the highs and trying to get lower because there's no follow-through off the highs at the moment. So here comes the hard edge bounce now, the number three signal. I think the way the market is moving right now, we're getting all these yellow bars kind of cropping up. It would be advisable to do a second push on all these signals, namely let the signal engage and then flinch before you enter whether to buy or to sell. Okay, so we're alternating signals. We're obviously in a little bit of a sideways pattern.
I'm debating running this one out again. But I guess I'll take my profit target if I can get it. If they bring me in. Okay. Wow. That uh, support zone around 55.97. Crazy strong. We've hit it now three times on the number. There we go. Come on. So we've got some conflicting signals. Again, that's kind of the nature of a sideways market. Oh, you're kidding me. That's crazy. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to get stuck here in a sec. You scoundrels. All right. You're going to be like that? Two can play at that game. Jake's asking, what's this indicator here on my chart? This is the Geiger counter from Indicator Warehouse. Uh, the Geiger counter is essentially a tape reader. It shows you the bid and ask, gives you a, a brief history of the order flow so you can see who's being stronger, the buyers or the sellers. 
Uh, the needle gives you a very short-term bias, and the dial is very informative because if you see the dial, most of the time it's bouncing back and forth, but if you see the dial pull one way or the other and stay there for like two or three or four seconds even, that's suggesting there's a lot of buying or selling pressure, whether it's on the bull side or the bear side. And we normally expect the market to react as a result. See how they're kind of favoring here the bear side. Oh, they, oh there we go. They're sticking for a little bit. The Geiger counter was developed because one of our owners said, can you give me a tool to let me know when I need to get tighter with my stops or perhaps exit a trade? It's also useful for entering a trade, but that was the original purpose. So if you were long here and you see the Geiger counter keep pulling and sticking here to the short side, you might be inclined to bring your stops in a little bit tighter in anticipation of a possible reversal. All right, well, the buyer's pushing hard. Yeah, Aspen, I think you're right, Aspen says, a lot of emotions today. Uh, Jake is asking, does the trade manager handle the contract size if you buy and sell without setting the prices with the green and red button so if you just punch into a trade let's say you just wanted to punch in with a buy order short answer is yes now if i had set a swing trade uh, as my stop parameter and it was is that really the swing low no swing lows down here if I had set it, here I'll show you in a sec. Just want to get it, there we go, <laughs> back at break even. So if my stop strategy is down here now and I hit the buy or sell market button, you see it will not allow me to place the trade because with my current risk parameters, I can't afford the stop way down there. If you don't have any stops enabled, it will go to your default stop, which you can preset when you start up your trade manager. I have my invalid trail stop set at 30 ticks. I think by default it's set at 10. Uh, the reason I set it at 30 is I didn't want to have to panic about moving my stop once I set my order. So for instance, if I hit my buy or sell market button here, this is 30 ticks away now. If it were 10 ticks away, it would be right there and I would quickly have to grab it and move it out of harm's way. Once the trade is active, I can, you know, pull my stops, adjust my trade accordingly. I can move my profit objective, I can change my break even, you know, I can do all kinds of things once the trade goes live. But to have that initial uh, opportunity, I didn't want my stops so tight that first thing I had to do was get in there, grab my stop, get it out of the way in case the market was moving against me a little bit. All right, so I hope that makes sense.
let's see if this doesn't get back. Oh, here, let's do it like this. Get me back to a break even. Come on. Thanks, Steve. Steve says Treasury, re, Treasury report came out a few minutes ago at the top of the hour. That no doubt that's what gave the stock market a shot in the arm. Hey, way to go, Tony! Tony says uh, got that last Nasdaq rally with a scalp plus a runner. Nicely done. I guess I needed to move my profit target down, not my break even trigger. There we go. Let's try that. Good. Out at more or less break even, no harm, no foul. Oops, close that. <laughs> Nicely done, Natalia. Natalia says, Good morning, Eric. Two number three signals and 80 ticks in profit. <laughs> Nicely done. Natalia says, The rafter is the rock. Yes, it is. Half the battle in trading is just finding a signal that you're prepared to take. The Raptor signals, as well as the DTS signals, are high probability signals. Unfortunately, they're not 100% correct, but they are still high probability signals that you can take with a, you know, a certain amount of confidence. This is a tough trade because we've got all this here to try to cover. Hopefully the market will get up above the primary and uh, where's the next profit target after the primary? Ooh, way up there. Let's try that. We're gonna swing for the fences on this one. All right, so a nice follow through there on the breakthrough through the primary resistance. You can see we were struggling a little bit with that. It'll be a pretty substantial move to get up here to the secondary resistance. That's almost retracing half of yesterday's uh, downtrend. A full retrace would see us up here. 
well, a three quarter retrace would see us up here at the next resistance line at around 56, 77 half. And maybe it's time to do one of those. Start to protect some of that open profit. And hopefully we will get one more run up. Aspen says, I got tagged on two small losers down 150. You know, that's the key, though. Try to keep those losers small. This is where the risk manager really shines, the trade manager, in containing your risk to a certain amount of your capital. Uh, Jake is asking, are there scalp strategies for the Raptor, or do you just trade the three signals? Well, a scalp strategy has more to do with the profit objective than the signal. If you're looking to scalp, uh, typically a scalper's target is $50. If you're looking to scalp, you can take these secondary signals. They will usually be good for a scalp, but remember, Earning more money does not mean trading more often. This is not a production line. You earn more money by trading more contracts. Now, I, I know, Jake, you're, you're new to the room here, and you probably haven't heard my, my little rant, so I'm going to... I'm going to entertain you. <laughs> just a moment. I just need to make a note here in my journal where I got stopped out. Okay. <clears throat> what most traders don't realize is that you don't need to trade a lot to make a lot of money. Most people come to trading with a production line mentality, right? Because that's all we know. Right? You're at your job making widgets. If I can make more widgets, I can make more money, right? Makes sense. So if I can trade more often, I can make more money, right? Sure. I'll just scalp in and out for you know, $50 at a time, and I'll make buckets full of money. Well, yes and no. What traders forget is that as you trade more often, the probabilities of string together several successive winners decreases. This is another reason we hold out for high probability signals, but long story short, every trade is essentially a 50-50 proposition. Some signals will have a higher probability of success and others will have a lower probability of success, but really at the end of the day, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen here. Right now, the market has an equal chance of going up as it does of going down. Very much like flipping a coin. 
So if you flip a coin and it goes up, you're trying to flip heads. See how many times in a row you can flip heads. First try, you have a 50-50 chance, right? Second time you do it, you're trying to flip heads twice in a row. Now your probabilities have gone down to 25%. Chances you will flip heads three times in a row are only 12.5%. Chances you will flip heads four times in a row are six and a quarter. Chances of flipping heads five times in a row are a dismal 3%. 3%, three times out of 100, you will flip, statistically, flip heads five times in a row. So then how do you make money as a trader? Well. What people don't realize is that if you can find two $50 trades in a day, or conversely, one $100 trade in a day, you can earn as much money as you want. How is that possible? Well, if you net $100 a day, there's uh, essentially 200 trading days in a year, that's $20,000 a year. That's trading one contract twice a day for $50. Now, we're going to ignore commissions and fees for the moment, uh, but even instead of $20,000, if you walk away with $18,000, that's hardly chump change on a single contract. So if you're trading two contracts, well, now that $20,000 becomes $40,000. If you're trading four contracts, that 20,000 becomes 80,000. If you're trading 10 contracts, that 20,000 becomes 200,000. You see how this works? And that's all from two $50 trades a day. That's not from trading 10 times a day, every day. And um, I like to share this story. A fellow came to me, oh, I guess it's probably about four or five years ago now. He came to me for one-on-one -on -one coaching. He wanted some private coaching, and he said, Eric, I want you to teach me how to be a scalper. I want you to show me how to take 100 trades a day. Well, I can show you how to make it take 100 trades a day, but I told him, you will never be a successful trader trading 100 times a day. He heard about all these high-frequency traders and how they were making reams of money. Well, yes and no. I knew one of them. Uh, he was following a 30-second chart. He was so jacked on coffee and cigarettes, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. So, you know, it, it's a transition to be sure, but you got to get away from that production line mentality as a trader. Okay, we're getting an early sell signal here in the in the hawk, we have a red bar buy signal, which we can short. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I forgot, I have to change that back. Here, we'll just do this. So the red bar buy signal tends to develop near the end of a trend. It results from a very, very deep pullback. We've got red bars and a buy. It's realistic to expect the market to test the extreme. So if you chose to buy this, that's a, that's a probable buy. I'm thinking a, another failure here through the low is likely going to give us a little bit of a pullback. Maybe back to around... Oh, well, it could be fairly deep. We may even get back down here to 56.16. That's certainly feasible. Oh, now we're getting a red bar buy just to, or pardon me, a uh, first micro macro cross just to keep things interesting. I'll stay with the short signal for the moment. And uh, for you new people in the room, too, when you ask me these questions, 
uh, I don't ever want to sound like I'm talking down to anybody. So if I, if it sounds like I'm criticizing something that you might have asked, please, please don't take offense. I am certainly not talking down to you. I have made every trading mistake you will ever make and then some. And as you can witness here on a daily fashion, I continue to make <laughs> some of the most basic mistakes sometimes. I don't know if that's encouraging or not. <laughs> All right, well, the Falcon is working here on a possible trend change. The Raptor, I don't know if that's enough of a test of the extreme to produce a soft edge sell signal for us or not. John is asking, Eric, will you detail how you would set up an aggressive growth strategy utilizing the trade management? I think you're referring to the trade manager. Um, it's actually pretty basic, John. If you want to be aggressive, increase the amount you have at risk per trade. But ideally, you want to still keep it below 5% or 5% or less. Um, but Quite frankly, the more money you put in play, the more you will earn. That's really all there is to it. It's, again, not about trading more often, but rather when you have a signal that you believe to be a high probability signal, is just to throw more capital at it. See here we're getting a, a trend change signal. It's counter trend in the face of a strong trend, so I really don't I don't feel like putting much more than $250 on the table. But that's me. Right? If if you if your goal is to you know take ten thousand and try to run it up to a hundred thousand by the end of the year, then you're going to need to put a little bit more money in play. And, you know, if you're okay, if things don't work out and you w end up walking away from the 10000 by the end of the year, then, then that's <laughs> what you need to do. But yes, it isn't as complicated as people think it needs to be. They think, oh, you know, I've got to do this, that, and the other thing. No, just focus on finding two or three quality signals during the day. That's all you need, two or three signals. And then throw capital at it as much as you can afford. Even at 5%, you know, you'll have some staying power. Uh, even with rough math, if you take 10 stinkers in a row, uh, sure, you've got approximately a 50% drawdown. It's actually going to be closer to around 40%. It's still a stinger, but you haven't wiped yourself out. If you're routinely risking about 10% of your capital, or as you did, or as I did with my very first trade, this is going back about 25 years now, my very first trade in corn, this is when $2,500 was enough money to open an account. I had a $1,500 risk position in a, in a $2,500 account. So I had two-thirds of my account on the line for my trade. And fortunately for me, the uh, cord market rallied and I didn't lose my $1,500 or it would have been a very short trading career. All right. 
are we going to get any follow through on this? My goodness, they keep trying to flash us these uh, short signals and then they just turn on their heels and run it up. Kind of like a sucker's bet. Here, come on, try to get me. And I have a feeling they're going to do that to me again. Look at that. Give me that double top. I, again, this is where a second push opportunity is very helpful, right? It's a counter trend signal. Let the signal engage. Look to see where the limit of the market is and then short below there. I got in a little bit quicker here than I should have. But maybe this double top will hold. catch a lucky break. Oh, I see what you're getting at, John. Yeah, John says, would adding more contracts when you are at break even part of, be part of such a growth tactic? Yes, so what John's talking about is scaling in. So let's say you bought here. Right, you bought your, oh, here, let's go on a different chart so things don't get too confusing. Yeah, I see what you're getting at now, John. Uh, okay, so John's saying, what if I bought here, right here, and the market's rallied, and now, you know, my trade is at break even. Um, should I consider buying in again off of, a, say, another breakout above a high or off the next signal? Yes, yeah, absolutely. That's also... Uh, an aggressive uh, way to increase your, your position size rather than add more right out of the gate. Uh, you can scale into a position as the, as the position grows. So let's say you chose to buy in here you know, your initial stop would be right here, so you would have this amount in play. Um, so this is really your only risk. Yeah, that's, that's uh, certainly possible. What some traders like to do, and Ken Roberts was famous for recommending this is what he would suggest people do is that they pyramid their earnings. So let's say you started with one contract down here and then as you could afford, as your profits allowed you to afford more, you would come in and you would buy two contracts here and then you would add, you know, a, two more contracts here, so now you're trading four, and you would add up here, this is called pyramiding, and so you'd have a whole whack of, of uh, contracts in play. I met a fellow who, who did that with rice of all things, and he turned a $10,000 account into a $40,000 account in one trade. And of course he thought, Oh, well, this trading thing is easy. <laughs> and by the time he got to me, he had lost 30 of his $40,000 and he was back to $10,000. The problem with pyramiding is that your trades, if you don't know this already, um, it, here's your entry. You become very, very top heavy, right? You've got... If the market starts to move against you, you've got a lot of contracts up here losing money, 
and only a small number of contracts down here earning money. Um, I would recommend if you're going to add to your position while you're in the trade is that you do what they call pillaring, where you would just add, if you start with one contract, if you start with one contract down here, you would add one as you can afford it, add another one, add another one. So you're never really top heavy. Whereas if you pyramided, you may have, you know, 16 contracts working for you up here. When you pillar, you only have four, but should the market reverse from up here, you only have one contract working against you and three contracts still making you money, three contracts still profitable. Versus all of a sudden having 16 contracts <laughs> losing money and maybe only eight contracts earning money. So you'll end up lose, losing money twice as fast as you can make it. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a very good suggestion though, John. I, I totally forgot about adding to your positions. So yeah, you don't need to go in heavy right out of the gate. I do need to see the market take out this low, however. Did I get filled on that? No, I did not. Oh, I did. When did that happen? I got short here on the hawk trade as well. Hazards of moderating a trading room. You got to keep tabs on all your open positions. The market is crazy strong today, just like it was insanely bearish yesterday. Today, it is quite bullish, and I should be focusing on buying opportunities, not selling opportunities. Crude oil is putting in a mighty run as well. I uh, haven't got the cloud crossover signal yet. The number one crossover signal. We did pick up a nice uh, counter trend signal here, but that was all pre-market. All right, so we'll set that back on the shelf. Oops. Oh, darn it. They did get up there and take my, uh, my stop. Well, we'll see if they give me another hard edge opportunity here. We have the hard edge buy right here on the Raptor, nice little bounce off of the primary resistance zone.
they're struggling again. So we had that nice rally up, and now you can see here on the hawk as well, we're introducing quite a few more yellow bars. Things kind of moving sideways on us a little. Potential first micro macro cross higher. Uh, very observant. Pujar is asking, why are the some of the bars wider than the others? Why are some of the candles fatter? I am using the Indicator Warehouse Dynamic Equa Volume Bars. They are a uh, an Equa Volume Bar that will work on a Renko or Range style bar. Normally, Equa Volume Bars only work on uh, traditional time-based candlesticks. For those of you unfamiliar with equivolume charting, a fellow by the name of Richard Arms, who has developed many indicators that traders use, was trying to figure out a way to incorporate volume into his trading. Because, of course, if you look at a volume chart, Pardon me. Everybody knows volume is important, and yet, looking at a volume chart, it's very difficult to decipher any of that. Right? It's really hard to get a grip on on the volume. So what he decided to do was he decided to paint the bars wider for heavier volume. You can see this bar right here has a lot of volume with it. Therefore, it is wider relative to the other bars. And likewise, as you will see, every time you have a fat bar, it's because there's more volume on it. So, yeah, it's very helpful, the uh, dynamic equivolume bars. They give you... Like, we know there's going to be heavy support down here because there was a lot of trading going on there. Likewise, heavier support here. There's always going to be a wide bar when the market decides to turn. It's just how it is. There's always a lot of trading going on when the market changes direction. So right now we're going down. You can see we've got a fair amount of volume on this bar relative to the others. If the market rallies from here, well, then that's probably a low that will hold. I know one of the DTS owners who has the dynamic echo volume bars will draw lines across this chart where the heavy volume is occurring. And he will use those areas as places to run his stop. So let's say you were long off one of these signals. If the market turns and heads higher here, Given that there was a lot of volume going on here, he may choose to roll his stop up below that point now. And those are all available from the Indicator Warehouse website, or you can just email Adam, and he will put something together for you.
No, the well, as far as I know, the dynamic echo, the dynamic echo volume bars are not a part of Raptor. I do believe they are an add-on. I do have them on all my birds, but that's um, that's something to ask Adam. I'm not really all that familiar with the current offerings, the packaging. Well, we kind of hit the skids here now. Um, big run up out of the morning session, and now they're taking a breather. So we've got almost the same thing as yesterday, but in reverse. It'd be interesting to see whether the sellers can fight the market back or whether it's going to finish the day on a slightly bullish note. But you can see a lot of, a lot of sideways trading going on right now. I think Andres is long a position here. He says they better get back to the highs. Uh, it's um, it's a pretty safe bet, I think, that the market will try to rally. Uh-oh. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the market's probably going to fall off. <laughs> That's a good way to get prices to go higher. Yeah, there could be a little bit of a correction coming. I doubt it will be a major correction. It just looks like the buyers are having none of that today. Oh, way to go, John. John trading the pound US dollar pair. Says the Raptor just gave him a number two set up. Bear with me and I will try to pull that up here so we can all see it. I'll stop it. Okay, so yes, you've got the cloud crossover signal right here. A little bit of a pullback. 
which is also part of the cloud crossover signal. It looks like with your cloud crossover, the Raptor interpreted these couple bars here as your pullback phase. So you shouldn't be surprised to see a little bit more of a pullback into the trading band and then uh, the market might push it out again. That is very likely to happen. Sellers trying to get a little bit more aggressive now. We're back toward the bottom end of the trading range, as you can see, right through here. Very close to a hard edge. Oh, this, this explains a lot. Trade forecaster says we are in scalp mode. Well, that kind of holds true. Trend mode in about another 20 minutes time. So as they head into the lunch hour, trade forecaster is saying, we might actually see a trend unfold. Well, would that not be nice? Andres has an option spread going on the uh, on the S and P. Yes, I forgot option expiration tomorrow. Thanks for pointing that out. A reminder as well. While I think of it, there will be no trading room on Monday. I'm not going to be available this Monday, so the trading will resume on Tuesday. Okay. I'll. Try to remind you again tomorrow, but in case I forget, no trading room on Monday. Uh, Pujar is asking, has the trade forecaster been incorporated into the Raptor filter? No, these, I, I have some what we call system add-ons. And I have one per chart, and I only have one per chart to avoid the chart getting too cluttered. More for your sakes than for mine. So here on the Hawk, for instance, I have the Day Ranger. It's a tool here in the top left corner. It tells me what the current uh, range is. You can see that today's range, just shy of 350 ticks. Yesterday's range, 540. And that just blows away what the average 5, 10, and 30 day range has been. So what does that tell me? Well, it tells me the market is expanding. I can probably go for bigger profit targets. I may need to run a wider stop because the market's becoming a little bit more volatile. So that's the day ranger. That is an add-on. Here on the Falcon, I have the ultimate support and resistance suite the support and resistance lines that forecast for today's trading. Here on the Eagle, I have the trade forecaster, which gives me the current market environment and also predicts what the next market environment will be and for how long. And then here on the Raptor, I have the Geiger counter, which is like a tape reader. You get to see the, the order flow, the buying and the selling, the dial. You see how it's pulling and sticking to the short side? Well, that's suggesting that we might see a very short-term move lower, although it did counter to the buy side there. So we won't get too aggressive on that just yet. 
But as far as the Raptor filter goes, no, the Raptor filter is actually the Eagle Trend Trader. All the programming for the Eagle Trend Trader has gone into this Raptor filter here at the bottom. All right, boys and girls, it looks like they're going to bounce around here a little bit. Your best bet on the day is still to remain bullish, uh, even though we just did flash a first micro macro cross lower, and it looks like it has found its profit objective, but we're also into the hard edge on both the Eagle and the Raptor, and that means that we can probably anticipate at least a little bit of a reaction down here. Uh, but the buyers, they've got the market in hand today, no question about that. I have a meeting at the top of the hour, so we're going to close the trading room just a couple of minutes early here, but I will see you all tomorrow morning. We'll talk to you then. Bye for now.